Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Hello. My name is Justin Marsh. I'm the political director at Vermont Conservation Voters, and I want to thank you all for being here, as well as our four candidates tonight. We have Dale Azaria, Tiff Bloomley, Bram Kleppner, and Larry Lowack. They are all candidates for the Democratic nomination in Chittenden 13. The groups that came together today to bring you this forum are Vermont Conservation Voters, Planned Parenthood of Northern New England Action Fund, Vermont specifically, uh, the ACLU of Vermont, Rights and Democracy, and VPIRG, Vermont Public Interest Research Group. Tonight we're going to be asking them questions about how they feel uh, and how they will pri prioritize climate resilience, rep uh, reproductive rights, criminal justice, housing, our democracy, and the legislature's role in leading the state. So for con some context, Chittenden 13 is the south end of Burlington, including the South End Arts District, the Five Sisters Neighborhood, Lakeside, Oak Ledge, and Five Avenues. The primary election is August 13th. That's 22 days away. Uh, you can vote now by going to your city clerk or calling them and requesting a mail-in ballot. Town Meeting TV is here today recording this, so you can look for a recording and share that with your neighbors. Uh, it will be on their YouTube in a couple of days. So the format for today, um, you each will have an opening and closing statement, uh, and then two minutes for each uh, question, for most of the questions, a few shorter ones at the end, um, and we'll be rotating the order in which we answer those questions. Um, each organization has submitted one question, and then uh, we came together to, to ask two towards the end. Uh, Dan Fingus with VNRC, Vermont Natural Resources Council, is here um, with their VCV hat on um, to play timekeeper. You will have a, a signal of when you have 30 seconds left and then 10 seconds left, and then we will throw you out if you go beyond the timer. Uh, and that's, yeah, Dan, look at Dan. I mean, between Dan and I, watch out. I know, yes, serious business at this forum. All right, so I think, I think I'm ready to go. Does that sound good to you all? Start off with some introductions, some opening statements. We'll start with Dale. Thank you, and I want to start by saying thank you to Vermont Conservation Voters and the other organizations for sponsoring this forum. I also want to say thank you to the other candidates for being part of a strong field and what feels to me like a really good, healthy race. I'm honored to be part of it. We're facing a lot of challenges as a city, a state, and a country, but there's also new and exciting energy for dealing with them, especially over the last 24 hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm running because my experience and expertise are what we need in the legislature right now. I wanna to work towards solutions for our biggest issues, including housing and homelessness, school funding, and the environment. Having worked as a lawyer in state government for six years under two governors, and having worked as an environmental advocate for another four years, I know what it takes to get things done in Montpelier. I want to help bridge the divide between the legislature and the governor, or at least ensure that the legislature passes laws that will be fully implemented. My husband, Alan, who's here in the audience sitting next to my mom, uh, Alan and I moved to Burlington 30 years ago. We raised two children here who thrived in the Burlington schools. I want to ensure that that's the case for all Vermont families. Especially now with the Supreme Court dismantling abortion rights, environmental protections, and more, we need people in the legislature who have the technical savvy to protect our rights and our future. The best part of running for office, without a doubt, is getting the opportunity to talk with so many of my neighbors. A lot of the folks who are in the audience here I met for the first time over the last month and it's been a real joy. If I haven't come to your door yet, please reach out to me. You can contact me via my website, daleazariavt.com. Thank you. You don't want to knock over here. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, my name is Tiff Plumley. Tiffany, but nobody calls me that. Um, I, <clears throat> I wanted to, th again, thank our hosts, um, the sponsors of this event. I know that they put it on pretty quickly. Um, uh, in the wake of the flood and everything that kind of transpired, um, I've had the honor of serving Chittenden 13 for four years. Um, 
a little background for those of you who don't know me well. Uh, my partner and I moved here um, in 1997 on the eve of a statewide debate on civil unions. And the, our move was prompted in part because we wanted our children to grow up in a community where the fact that they had two moms wasn't going to be an issue. And second, we wanted to, we wanted to live in a smaller place where we could feel connected to our community. Um, so I find the greatest joy and have through my different um, careers in seeing children and adults discover and then develop uh, their potential wherever it lies. And you know, I've been a history teacher I served as executive director of Vermont Works for Women for 17 years and expanded our programming to building affordable housing in Vermont's prisons, offering pre-academy policing programs, and <clears throat> with my partner Liz starting Rosie's Girls. Through that work, I became an advocate for alternatives to incarceration <clears throat> and expanded prison programming, paid family leave, and pay equity. And in 2020, when the pandemic seemed to have raised the political will to address issues I'd worked on for most of my adult life, I ran to represent the South End in the House. I serve as a member of the Appropriations Committee, uh, which builds a state budget, and in that capacity, I uh, work with three committees on budgets related to housing, substance use, and mental health, and the legislature. It's been an honor. Thank you. My name is Bram Kleppner, and I'm running quite simply because I think I can be helpful. I just finished 13 years as CEO of Danforth Pewter in Middlebury, a mid-sized manufacturing company. And while I was there, we were able to institute company-wide profit sharing and partially paid maternity leave. We added an employee member to the board of directors. Um, by the time I left, the board of directors was 50% women, and the senior management team was 50% women, and most of the managers at the level below that were also female. Um, another thing we did was put the company on the path to zero fossil fuel use. We built a solar farm and installed heat pumps and put in a charging station for employees and customers to use for electric cars. And that work led the Speaker of the House, Krowinski, to Speaker Krowinski, to appoint me to the Vermont Climate Council to represent Vermont manufacturers as we develop the plan to get Vermont to its statutory emissions reductions and also to build resilience into our communities, all aspects of our communities, so that we can continue to function successfully in the more violent and more extreme weather that we are likely to uh, experience over the coming decades. I also served for two years on the Vermont Tax Structure Commission, working to make Vermont's tax system fairer, simpler, and more sustainable. I spent five years as co-chair of Vermont's Medicaid and Exchange Advisory Board, which uh, working to provide access to quality health care to all Vermonters. And I also served under Governor Shumlin on the Governor's Business Advisory Council on Healthcare Financing. And I hope that that combination of policy uh, experience across a number of key areas, combined with the experience of having led a uh, business, will be helpful to the legislature as we grapple with all the big, complicated, interlocking problems in front of us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Lewak. I have lived in the South End for 30 years, like Dale, and also like Dale and her husband, um, we have we raised two uh, wonderful young adults, um, now 27 and 34, and um, I just became we just became grandparents about a year ago, which has been a, a, an amazing addition to our already full lives. Um, the babies are doing well, identical twin girls, <laughs> first time grandparents and first time parents. So we're all learning as we go. Um, I have been involved in political work for uh, many years. Uh, I was actually um, asked by someone, to, a reporter today, well, when was the first time you got involved in a Democratic campaign? And it was actually when I was 16 years old. I was still, I think I was maybe a sophomore or a junior in high school. I was asked to help out with a candidate for state legislature in my home district back in the DC metro area. And uh, I was his gopher. I did everything that he needed, and he was elected. 
So uh, <laughs> that got me off uh, started, and I've been involved ever since. Um, I have worked for Democratic candidates, including um, Senator Peter Welch, who uh, was running for governor against Dick Snelling um, after Madeleine Kunin's administration, hosted a house party for him when we lived in Winooski, and also um, did similar work for Senator Doug Racine um, before and after he was lieutenant governor. Uh, I'm in this race because um, I feel like experience matters, and I just want to acknowledge that um, I, I appreciate the work and, and the dedication and commitment that Tiff, Tiff has shown in her four years in the legislature and that Gabriel Stebbins has shown. Um, I served for 10 years on Governor Howard Dean's Council of Environmental Advisors. I was um, almost as long as a that in that as a planning commissioner in Winooski and then in Burlington. Um, I know a fair amount about what it takes to get things passed in the legislature, because uh, I worked to get a bill, Act 62, passed in 2009. I do have um, issues that I will talk about um, during the rest of this evening's conversation, and I would appreciate your support. Thanks. The passing of the microphone will be a theme of the evening. <laughs> All right, so question one. You have two minutes each, 10 minutes total. The This past year, the legislature passed major environmental legislation, including modernizing the renewable energy standard, creating a first-in-the-nation climate super fund, responding to the devastating floods of 2023 with the Flood Safety Act, modernizing Act 250 to prioritize both conservation and making it easier to build housing in population centers and downtowns. Please reflect on those bills and tell us what your climate priorities are moving Moving forward, we will start with Bloomley. All right, now everybody has to call me Bloomley. <coughs> um, I want to give a shout out to my seatmate, Gabrielle Stebbins, who has, for the last four years, been an extraordinary leader um, as chair of the Climate Caucus um, and on her committee, Environment and Energy. I think she's been an extraordinary leader um, and uh, is a font of knowledge. Um, and because of her efforts and others, we were able to accomplish a lot in the last four years. And um, I wanted just to add a couple things. You know, we, we passed a phased-in ban on neonics, um, the pesticide um, that harm pollinate, pollinators. I don't, think I, I don't think a single issue got, I generated more email than that one issue. Um, and the Flood Safety Act. Um, you know, under the Flood Safety Act, we are, we're, we're doing our due diligence to map out wetlands, to map out floodplains. Um, um, we've beefed up the stewardship of dams by transferring, you know, kind of authority for that um, to the DEC. Um, I also just want to mention the kind of um, improvements we've made in the transportation sector. I mean, we've invested um, uh, tons of money, and I apologize, I, I don't have the exact figure in my head, but in electric charging stations, incentives for electric vehicles, um, and e-bikes. And VTrans um, uh, is required now to include complete streets um, planning when it designs um, new roads or rehabs existing ones. Um, and it, we've invested in kind of uh, regional pilots to help um, rural communities um, develop different modes of transportation. What next? I really look to my colleagues for this because this is not my area of expertise, but I sense that we have a, high, a lot of heavy lifting to do. <clears throat> Can I finish my sentence? No. Oh, okay. I, I think our biggest work, this is probably the main point of what I was going to say, is that, you know, we need to focus on implementation and transparency and reporting and tracking information. We've passed a lot, and now we have to really do our due diligence in that respect. You know, a, a fundamental part of my worldview, which is not as grim as it sounds, is that climate change threatens to damage or destroy everything you care about. And the not as grim as it sounds part is the threatens part. It is not inevitable. There are things we can do. And I think, um, you know, to pick up uh, a couple of themes from, from TIFF, um, Gabrielle Stebbins has been a strong champion on climate. And um, it is, she, as she told me, one of the reasons that she has endorsed me in this race for the, the seat that she is vacating. Um, she felt that 
uh, she wanted another strong climate advocate in, in the legislature to, to uh, succeed her. Um, you know, the Climate Superfund, it was sort of controversial, but, you know, my point of view, it's, it's pretty simple. The big oil companies have known for decades, the first article about global warming appeared in the New York Times in like 1956 or something, right? So we're 70 years in. They knew very clearly that using their products was damaging the environment, and they buried that information. And I think it's absolutely appropriate that they pay um, to fix the damage that they knowingly caused. Um, I would uh, say, you know, in terms of what's coming up, the things that we need to tackle uh, in the Climate Action Plan, we, the, the, the Climate Council had worked, and before the Climate Council, the state had worked for years to identify how we address transportation, transportation and heating being the two sectors that produce the most CO2 in our state. Um, we had decided to join a regional cap and invest program called the Transportation Climate Initiative. It fell apart very shortly before the Climate Action Plan was due, so we put in a placeholder. And our next big lift is implementing a program to address traffic emissions. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to pick up on um, a couple things that Tiff said. Um, I feel like the uh, Renewable Energy Standard Bill it was passed over the governor's veto, and I, I think that's a really strong signal that um, it's really important that um, everyone in the environmental community pay close attention to what state government is or is not doing to move that forward because obviously this administration does not want it to move forward. They made that abundantly clear with a veto and uh, I feel like uh, watchdogging that and pushing them to implement it in a timely, the, the standards in that bill in a timely way is really important given that uh, pushback. Um, I would like, and on EV charging station expansions, you know, we have oodles of federal money through the Inflation Reduction Act, and I think that's been supplemented by legislative appropriation to put in a much better network of EV charging stations across the state. But guess what? There's not a lot of stations popping up. I don't know about what you're seeing, but I'm not seeing very many of them actually being put into service. And uh, I, I've noticed that, and also for a similar uh, opportunity with um, the residential heat pump rebates that are available now at the federal level, or but are not available in Vermont. And in both cases, I feel like the state has dragged its heels and has not uh, moved aggressively to make those things available to everyday Vermonters. So, you know, we have, uh, as, as Bram mentioned, um, uh, you know, really our top priorities for uh, addressing climate change it, are in the transportation and the home heating sector. And those are two opportunities. There's plenty of funding available. We are not able to take advantage of it at the, the community level because the state has moved so slowly to make um, those programs, to roll those programs out. And lastly, I would say that um, I've become aware that uh, the, the our Green Mountain Transit Company is a uh, very, very shaky footing and is um, proposed significant service cutbacks. And I think that we need to make sure as part of our funding of transportation programs that climate friendly, that we are identifying permanent funding source for tr subsidized public transit to enable that to happen for everyone and not just people who can afford to pay the full fare. Thanks. Um. I also want to build off something that Tiff said at the very start, right where she got cut off with the comment about implementation, and I think everybody has recognized this. I will say that part of why I am running for office is because I worked in first the Shumlin administration and then the Scott administration, and I have seen how important it is for especially under Governor Scott for the legislature to keep an eagle eye out on how the laws that the legislature passes do and don't get implemented. Um, Governor Scott likes to keep the state workforce down, likes to keep the state budget down, and then say there aren't enough people to do this work. And I think that there is a real risk, particularly with the statewide uh, floodplain permitting, and with the protections for wetlands that were part of the climate resilience bill, that that's gonna happen unless the legislature is watching and unless people understand how the administration works. 
Um, I also want to add that I've been for the last four years working for Conservation Law Foundation, which along with Vermont Conservation Voters, VNRC, VPIRG, and others um, were, the, um, were, were strong advocates for pretty much all of the bills um, that, that were mentioned as part of this issue. Um, I think we did make a great start, but if there's not adequate implementation, we're not going to get where we need to go. Thank you. Great. And Tip, I will I will refer to you all now as first names. It did feel a little like softball coach, didn't it? Like, Bloomley, come on. Bloomley, get, get on it. Yeah. All right. Lessons learned as a moderator. All right. Question number two. We will be starting with Bram. Uh, this is ACLU of Vermont's question. Vermont's prison system has some of the worst racial disparities in the country, incarcerating black people at more than seven times the rate of white people. What policies would you propose to address this, this, this systemic racism and eliminate the racial disparities that exist in our criminal legal system? Boy, race is just an awfully deeply embedded problem in our society. And uh, you know, Isabel Tompkins' book, Cast, pointed out very clearly that if you grew up in the U.S., you are a racist. Um, you can't help it. We're in this toxic brew of racism, and we all absorb it from the day we're born in the media, in the things we read, and how we see interactions in our communities. Um, in our particular community, um, you know, unfortunately, the, the police chief, who I admire a great deal, um, but he and the previous mayor uh, have been somewhat resistant to bringing in training. There is the Center for Policing Equity in Denver, which has worked with police forces around the country to identify the uh, subconscious or not subconscious bias among their officers and address the behaviors that that leads to. You know, I was talking to someone who has worked on this extensively, and you know, she told me about uh, a black woman driving in Burlington, Georgia plates on her car, a police officer tailed her for 10 or 15 minutes. Eventually, as she pulled up in front of her house, put on his lights and sort of said, so what are you doing here? Um, and eventually uh, said, I pulled you over because you failed to turn your turn signal on 100 feet before the stop sign. And these kind of pretextual stops um, are awful for everybody. You know, the, obviously the, the victim of this kind of behavior, it's awful and possibly traumatic, but it has also taken a police officer out of the game who could have been working on um, like actual crimes and actual problems. So, you know, I think we really need to be open to addressing this in an honest way. Thank you. Got to stay in turn here. So uh, when I, I was executive director of the National Alliance for Mental Illness Vermont chapter for three and a half years, about 15 years ago, and um, I decided to tag myself along on a legislative field trip that was organized at the time to the Southern State Correctional Center in Springfield. So we had the opportunity to tour the inside of that facility, and I was really struck by two things. One is that um, about two-thirds of the um, prison inmates, if they're still politically correct to call them that, were um, people of color. And the other thing that struck me was that the so-called mental health wing that was set aside in that prison to provide care uh, or at least housing for individuals uh, diagnosed with a serious mental illness was a place, was probably the darkest place that I've ever seen in my adult life. Um, it, it had no hope and no, no programming, no supports for those um, uh, prisoners and uh, I walked away from that determined to make a difference and that's what led me to work with a number of legislators uh, to uh, pass the Act uh, 62 in 2009 that provided civil rights protections for prisoners with serious mental illness to ensure that they would have access to treatment while incarcerated. But back to racial bias in the criminal justice system, I mean, we do have a professor who lives in our district, uh, Stephanie Seguino from UVM, who's done some great work, some great research to exactly document the degree of bias in police stops in um, Greater Burlington. And um, I don't think that the past uh, mayor's uh, administration ever really seriously dealt with 
the data that they found in that report. So clearly, um, as Bram suggests, um, more anti-bias training for officers is really important at the front end of their service and then again throughout their time of service. And then I think um, we could do more statewide to incentivize recruitment for the state police and in local police forces in BIPOC communities outside of Vermont to hire more officers of color. We need to do that in order to um, de-racialize the response of our law enforcement agencies. Okay, well, the notes that I had about how to answer this question are all things that have already been covered. So this is gonna repeat a little bit, but I also wanna kind of put my own spin on these things. First of all, um, pretextual stops, which Bram mentioned. Um, these are traffic stops that happen at a police officer's discretion, not for significant safety reasons. And um, one thing that Stephanie Seguino, who's already been mentioned, told me is that Vermonters are stopped by the police for these kind of routine issues way more than the national average, three times the national average. So we are all being stopped by the police more than any other state thinks is necessary. That's something to be aware of. Um, and we need to bear in mind that people of color are disproportionately impacted by this, both because they're more likely to be stopped based on an officer's discretion, and also because the interaction between the driver and the police officer is more fraught. So that's one thing. Another thing that's already been mentioned is mental health supports. If we had better care for people who need it and who seek it out, we would have less of a problem with crime. Uh, likewise, support for people who are struggling with addiction. A huge proportion of our crime, our actual crime, not the pretexts, is uh, fueled by people who are struggling with substance abuse disorder. And if those people got the help that they need, that would reduce a lot of the pressure on this system. Lastly, I agree with what's already been said that it is essential that we have a continued, increased and continued emphasis on training and better recruiting practices. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think we're probably all on the same page. Um, there's pl plenty of evidence that has demonstrated racial bias in policing. Um, Stephanie Seguino is, I think, a remarkable resource for this community. Um, I, I guess I just, there are two things I want to say. One, the good news is I believe that we are beginning to recognize this problem. And, you know, we are looking at ourselves. We are commissioning outside studies of our system. Um, the adjustment reinvestment study on racial disparities listed a whole lot of things that we could be doing differently. We are collecting racial data from police departments now by empowering the Criminal Justice Council to sanction or decertify police officers who act outside of police policies, um, we are able to, um, <clears throat> I was gonna say police, that behavior um, and insist upon a code of behavior statewide. And we have made significant investments in restorative justice. Uh, and I, we need to do more of that. Um, we need to, and so what? what is the work we need to do as I understand it, continue to invest, is, invest in alternatives to incarceration and, to, and in restorative justice, eliminate qualified immunity, continue to invest in embedding social workers in police units, <clears throat> because their expertise can help defuse situations that bec can become violent. Um, and instead, maybe, of pulling people over, as you were talking about, Dale, for things like a broken taillight, notify them via mail and tell them to get it fixed. All right, thank you all. Question number three is courtesy of Planned Parenthood Vermont Action Fund. Abortion and reproductive liberty are constitutionally protected rights for Vermonters. However, there are ongoing attacks at the federal level, including attacks on access to contraception, medical abortion, gender-affirming care, IVF, and even emergency services. If we were to see a federal abortion ban, Vermont would see that right taken away. 
Given that and the ongoing financial hardships following COVID and stagnant Medicaid reimbursements in our state, how will you advocate for increased investment and protections in sexual and reproductive health care, including abortion? What else do you th- what else do you think is needed to strengthen or maintain abortion rights in our state? And we will start with Larry. Well, we just heard a litany of really important things that Vermont has already done to protect reproductive rights and uh, care. And I uh, strongly supported all of those when they were adopted. And um, I feel like there might be some things that we could do to further strengthen it. For example, I I don't remember the exact term for it, but there was a a provider protection bill that was passed and signed into law, which ensures that if Texas or Florida decides to go after um, reproductive health care providers and services in Vermont, that um, we will not cooperate with attempts to prosecute them. And I I feel that's very strongly that um, we need to follow through on that and make sure that all of our state's attorneys and all of our law enforcement agencies are aware of that law and are prepared to follow through as necessary um, because that that could get very confrontational and very difficult for providers who are placed in the position of being um, chased by law enforcement from other states for doing their jobs. Um, I feel that uh, it's really important that um, we have a, a, a kind of a, a unified uh, approach to the so-called uh, pregnancy crisis centers, which we do have some of in Vermont because they are not that at all. They do not provide health care. They are actually advocating very strongly for women who are questioning whether they want to carry a, a child to term in a pregnancy to that people uh, do, go ahead and have the baby because it would be a danger to their health to terminate the pregnancy. Oh, oh, along the lines of the laws that we have that protect access to abortion. And I, I think those centers get off the hook a lot. Um, and I think it's it should be a public policy goal that we expose them for what they are and, and not allow young women to be duped into thinking that um, there's any um, particular threats to their own health by pursuing an abortion that they've decided that they want. And then these they go into these centers and they get Talk, try to get talked out of it. And finally, I would say that we should be looking at um, uh, you know, really uh, creating an ethic in the state that understands that um, pregnancy and appropriate reproductive rights and, and uh, pregnancy prevention care is really uh, a, a right in Vermont, and we should not treat that at any different than any other form of health care. So, I started my legal career with the National Organization for Women Legal Defense Fund back in the uh, late 1980s. I worked with them on two different kinds of abortion cases. Um, One was uh, ensuring that uh, people who needed to access facilities where abortions were being provided could physically get into those spaces. This was at a time which I believe has continued in different parts of the country and it, with different levels of intensity um, when people were barricading the entrances to prevent women from going in and getting the health care that they needed. Uh, so we were working on that. Um, and I was really pleased to see when I was looking at the 2023 law that uh, Larry just mentioned that the legislature passed that one of the other things that it does in addition to providing that protection for the providers of uh, abortion and other reproductive services is that it pr- for, blah, blah, forbids preventing access to health care. So I thought that was great. It brought me right back to the very start of my career. And that was just, um, I'm really pleased that the legislature took that step. I think part of what the legislature needs to do is continue paying attention to the threats that are coming from the Supreme Court and from national politics. Um, And uh, that is part of what I want to do. I want to use my legal expertise uh, to work within the legislature to make sure that we continue being out in front of these threats as best we can and ensuring that people have access to health care. I think we owe an incredible <clears throat> debt of gratitude to Becca Ballant, Planned Parenthood, um, and Speaker um, Betsy Johnson, and then Jill Krowinski for having the foresight <laughs> to introduce uh, an amendment to our Constitution uh, 
um, that protects um, access to reproductive freedom. Um, it, 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 I feel very lucky to live in Vermont um, for the kinds of protections that we have. Um, well, as uh, Justin, our moderator, I didn't call you Mr. Marsh, um, <clears throat> had, had said, you know, uh, we need to talk about IVF and fertility uh, treatments. Is that part of reproductive uh, liberty? Um, shield laws, are we really prepared? And I think Larry has said this, you know, do we know how we will support as a state those practitioners and um, uh, organizations that provide ab abortions? I mean, what way can we do more um, as voters? <laughs> we can elect federal officials um, who will protect abortion rights. Um, I think we need to identify I, I have been talking with people about shortages in the medical field and OBGYN care, um, I, I, as I understand it, has diminished in the state. Um, and we need, we need to look at that and figure out how we can keep providers in the state um, so that people can have access to um, reproductive care and raise the medical reimbursement, uh, Medicaid reimbursement rate um, for providers, which is very, I mean, it's, it's, it is a huge problem for our state. And I'll just pick up uh, right from there in terms of Medicaid reimbursements. And they are a barrier to reproductive health for many members of our, our community. And uh, we need to address that. You know, I think um, legal protection for abortion and reproductive rights in this state we have, a, uh, we have an amendment in our Constitution. We have a legislature that is strongly pro-choice. Um, we do need to stay eternally vigilant because there are constant threats and attacks. Um, and I would say, in addition to the legal protections that we have in place and need to defend, um, we really need to work hard on access, and that's physical access in terms of how many miles people need to travel to get care to get abortion providers. It's financial access, whether through Medicaid or elsewise. It's information, it's access to information so people know where the services are, how they can get them, and how they can pay for them. And uh, I think there's plenty of work to be done on all of those fronts to truly ensure full access to reproductive rights in this state. Question number four is courtesy of VPIRG. Vermont has the lowest electricity rates and bills in New England because we have been prioritizing renewables and energy efficiency for 25 years. It's a huge success story. The legislature is now working to do the same efficiency and renewable work in the heating sector, but the fossil fuel industry, led by the ultra-conservative Koch network of organizations and aided by Governor Phil Scott, are attacking them uh, for it. The fossil fuel industry wants to keep things the way they are, no matter how much it costs Vermonters or damages the environment. What do you say to opponents of climate action in the face of the evidence that moving away from fossil fuels is good for Vermont's economy and environment? And will you vote to reauthorize the Affordable Heat Act? And we'll start with Dale. Uh, so the Affordable Heat Act is a great law. It promotes weatherization and electrification. Importantly, it provides benefits to families who are most burdened by the cost of heating their homes. It reduces their heating costs, and it keeps more of their money our money collectively in state, especially as we transition to in-state renewable electricity over time. It ramps down the use of biofuels and renewable natural gas over time as well. But there is still a long road ahead, as you alluded to, including development of the specifics over the next couple of years and a legislative check back in 2025. I want to be in the state house to make sure it happens and it's implemented as intended. Um, the renewable energy standard is another great law. It requires that we be using 100% renewable electricity by 2035. 
It requires more local renewable energy, meaning in-state, and it also requires more new renewable energy from anywhere in the system. It has limits on biomass, which means burning wood or other plant material to create electricity. Some say that this provision didn't go far enough, but it's a start and we can go farther. Um, one other issue that I've heard mentioned several times, and I think it's worth addressing, is whether it's important for us to be doing this in Vermont, given how small we are and how small our emissions are in the overall scheme of global warming. Um, I think it is really important. I think we here in Vermont, first of all, as we heard, we do benefit economically from doing this work. We also benefit with better insulated and therefore more comfortable homes, with cleaner air. Um, it also allows us to set an example for other states to show what's important and it's the right thing. Am I allowed to say what she said? <laughs> um, you know, I, I just want to say, um, you know, I'm really proud um, of Vermont, um, of the work that's been done over the last 30 years to reduce electrical costs. We had the lowest cost in New England, as Justin said, and, and that was because we chose to deregulate, <clears throat> not to deregulate electrical power and incentivize um, efficiency in the interest of protecting Vermont communities um, and their residents. And as a past board member of Vermont Energy Efficient Investment Corporation, which runs Efficiency Vermont, whose founder is right over there and lives in Chittenden 13. <laughs> I'm really grateful <clears throat> to the visionaries who brought that change um, to Vermont. So I really would echo what Dale has said about um, the Clean Heat Standard Bill. I really look forward to the, um, what do they call it, the um, potential study, um, which is measures kind of what's the market, um, what number of homes who heat with other fuels, the workforce that's required to switch over, um, and the supply of heat pumps available at any one time. I confess that I am somewhat skeptical of <clears throat> what we get from the Public Utility Commission, um, and I, I think that um, we're going to have to do an awful lot of our own homework, our own assessment um, of the costs because we've we've locked horns on this issue a couple of times um, especially with the res I um, that is all I I'm sorry that's all I need to say about that um, you know from the point of view of the Climate Council I will say that um, the governor and the PUC are not enthusiastic partners in this work, if I might uh, put it somewhat somewhat gently. Uh, so on the Climate Council, I do sit on the subcommittee, um, rather awkwardly named the Cross-Mitigation uh, Subcommittee, um, the Cross-Sector Mitigation Subcommittee. But it is the subcommittee that developed the proposals for both the Renewable Energy Standard and the Affordable Heat Act. And um, as we do that, we pass them either to the legislature or to the Agency of Natural Resources for either rulemaking or legislation, depending on the particular area. Um, you know, I will say the Affordable Heat Act, I do think, uh, as Dale said, is a, is a really good bill. And w would absolutely, uh, having voted to propose it and include it in our plan, I would absolutely vote to, to support it. And, you know, the, the effects, I mean, it is important primarily to reduce our emissions and, as others have said, to um, make homes more comfortable and healthier. You know, people have, especially lower income people, have old furnaces that are leaking emissions into their homes. And by removing that, um, Burlington Electric actually believes that our home uh, was the first historic structure in Burlington to get to zero emissions. We have no combustion happening in our home. and. Um, you know, that's great for us, and it should be equally great for everyone in, in the state. And the price of electricity, because as Tiff said, we were wise enough not to deregulate, is very stable and predictable and low. The price of fossil fuels is super volatile. You know, it's relying on fossil fuels to heat one's home um, causes a lot of problems. And we can find a, an equitable way to make sure that 
low and middle income Vermonters have access to electrification and all the benefits that follow. Yeah, I, I really like what I'm hearing at this table, and I would echo that these are all good things and represent progress. Um, I, I'm, I have reflected at times on how uh, Burlington Electric is really a model for the whole state in terms of having a 100% renewables per portfolio. Um, there is some controversy about, of course, the use of the McNeil plant on an ongoing basis and um, buying power that's generated in um, northern Quebec through Hydro-Quebec as to whether that truly meets the, the, uh, the goal of renewable energies, but uh, uh, renewable energy uh, portfolio. But I, I do feel like uh, setting a good example is really important for the rest of the state and um, for the rest of the country because um, it, by showing that it can be done and that it's not only uh, practical and feasible, but it also results in lower electric rates and very predictable and stable electric rates is a very powerful thing to demonstrate and a, a very powerful example that when other communities hear about this, they are more likely to emulate that and find out the secret to our success. Um, and, and I think that that's, that could be a very good thing for everyone. Um, I do think that the Affordable Heat Act is really a win-win for Vermont families. Uh, you know, the governor is quick to point out that uh, the clean heat standard could increase costs in the short term, but I didn't hear any discussion of medium and long term um, consequences from trying to veto and, and deep six that legislation. And that's really where the discussion needs to be. Um, you know, we need to make decisions for the next generation in Vermont and the generation after that. And part of that is really reflecting on what it means to continue uh, the, the high, high level uses of fossil fuels to heat our homes and to power our vehicles. And we can do better and we've shown we can do better and we just need to do more of it. All right, question number five is from Rights and Democracy. Vermont is in a housing crisis. The causes are complex and the solutions need to be multi-pronged. 30% of Vermont households rent their homes. Four municipalities, including the city of Burlington, have passed charter changes to adopt just cause eviction protections, but they haven't yet been approved by the legislature. If you are elected, would you support just cause eviction policies, and what other interventions would you support to make housing more affordable and accessible to all Vermonters? And we will start with TIFF. Um, I'll start with just cause eviction. Uh, I, su I supported it um, in the legislature in, when it came to the floor uh, three years ago. Is it three years ago? Uh, and every year have had conversations with um, the Committee of Jurisdiction, um, Committee on uh, Government Operations, and it has been very, very difficult to get that on the agenda. And there are a number of, I mean, we're in the same boat as a number of other municipalities, as you just said. Um, so my hope is <clears throat> that we will finally get that through. I know that our mayor is a strong proponent um, and we as a delegation organized to try to make it a priority um, and we will do that again. Um, I vigorously support, so uh, my appropriations budget includes housing um, and um, we put out a bill, H829, uh, that um, provided for a major investment in housing uh, and it didn't get a hearing in the Senate and that said parts of the bill were incorporated into the Act 250 bill um, uh, related to disability housing um, and eviction protections. Um, I want to be really clear that everybody I've talked to it seems to agree, oh gosh, 30 seconds, that zoning and permitting reform won't produce the 7,500 units of housing we need for low and middle income households, adults with developmental or physical disabilities, seniors, and those in recovery. That kind of housing doesn't pencil out for developers. And oh boy, <clears throat> I want us to be bold, as Madeline Kunin was bold however many years ago, when she founded the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. We need to make a major commitment in housing or we will nibble at the edges forever. Um, so, J 
just just evictions first. Um, you know, I think we all do not want people to lose their homes through no fault of their own. And um, as with many of these things, uh, you know, we do need to be careful of unintended consequences. I support um, just you know ensuring that evictions are only just ones and there are no unjust evictions. And I do know that there is the danger that if one um, if one makes it impossible or very difficult for landlords to evict problem tenants, you know, what I've heard from landlords is, you know, right now I don't mind, you know, I'll, I'll take a chance on someone. Even if I'm not sure they're going to work out, even if I'm not sure they'll be able to pay, I'll take a chance on them. If it becomes meaningfully more difficult, if I have a tenant who is disruptive to others, who is doing damage, um, if it becomes meaningfully more difficult, I will no longer be willing to take a chance on people who might be on the edge. So I think we have to take a, a pretty nuanced approach and be really careful that we are, in fact, not harming the very people we are hoping to help. And there does need to be a way to protect people from losing their homes through no fault of their own. Um, in terms of housing, absolutely agree. Zoning and um, building codes are not enough by any means, but they can be really helpful. And, you know, as uh, I mean, there's just a great project in White River Junction where they got a lot of affordable housing built, public private partnership. They found public and, and nonprofit money from, I think, seven different sources. The builders built it to spec. The nonprofit organization that's going to run it bought it from them and is operating it, including, I think, six units for people transitioning out of homelessness. So there are, uh, there are models. And um, with the housing crisis, we need to pursue every possible venue to make it easier and more affordable to build accessible housing for everyone. So in my day job, I work as the town planner for the town of Charlotte, and um, I work on the bleeding edge of local permit reform. Um, I've tried very hard to uh, push residents through a variety of strategies to simplify our permitting requirements and to identify opportunities for building badly needed accessible and affordable housing. Um, I'm not an expert in housing by any means, but I certainly uh, resonate and support the idea that we need an all of the above approach in housing. Um, I, I very much am grateful that the legislature has um, put some real money in the past couple of years in this past session to um, build more housing. But I do think we need to be careful that that assistance and those subsidies are targeted towards people who are most in need of housing for uh, the parts of the um, renters and for mi uh, missing middle housing um, for people who are working two jobs or three jobs between a couple and still can't afford the down payment or the monthly payments on an average priced home. So I, we need to be attentive to that as we ramp up those programs that, that provide subsidy. And we also need to talk to developers, especially affordable housing developers, such as the Champlain Housing Trust and Evernorth, who, who understand the business and understand what it takes for projects that are affordable to people of a, vari of a variety of incomes um, to make it able, make them able to pencil out their investments. Because if it doesn't work for them, it won't work for anyone, and the housing just won't get built. Um, I certainly feel like we can do more to um, identify the, the areas of greatest need and to target the subsidies where they're most needed as well. Housing is one of my top issues. Um, I actually wrote a long email about housing that I sent out to a kind of email blast last week. If any of you didn't get it and you aren't on my email list, please let me know because I would love to forward it to you if you want to read it. Um, I worked for six years at the State Department of Housing and Community Development. One of the things I did there was to be involved in the state's housing needs assessment, which is a study that gets done once every five years. The numbers have been challenging for years, and they've only gotten worse since 2020. Having a safe roof over one's head should be a human right. We don't always think of it that way. We don't treat it that way. We aren't achieving that here, but we should. Um, 
having a home, having a safe roof over your head is a key to affordability for Burlington and for the state as a whole. It's a key to good health. It's a key to workforce and economic development. It's a key to addressing homelessness and so much more. So what can we do? We can invest in affordable housing. We do that with federal funds. We do it with state funds. We do it through some of the organizations and programs that have been mentioned here. We need to keep doing that. We need to dig deeper and find more funding for that. We also need to keep pushing on the regulations that make it difficult to develop, especially in places that are well suited for development. Places with water and wastewater, places with roads, um, places that are suitable for or better yet already served by public transit. Um, and we need to think carefully about landlord tenant law. And this includes the just eviction question. This includes rent stabilization and other things. Um, I agree with some of what's been said up here that sometimes these laws, while well intentioned, can have pro uh, problematic consequences. And so I do think we need to take care of these issues, but we need to proceed with caution. All right, now we are focused on the questions that we came together as a um, as the hosts tonight to come uh, to give you these last two questions. So, Governor Phil Scott has used the most vetoes of any governor in Vermont's history and vetoed eight major bills again this year, including envir important environmental, land use, and addiction treatment bills. Most of those bills were then overridden in the House and in the Senate, many times with tripartisan support. In addition, the governor has also shown he's willing to ignore the advise and consent function of the Senate in his reappointment of the acting Secretary of Education. As a representative, how will you approach working with a governor who continuously disregards the role of the legislature and its elected representatives and senators from across Vermont? We will start with Bram. So I think um, many members of the legislature would agree that the working relationship between the legislature and the governor was not um, particularly productive or a good working relationship this term um, for a variety of reasons. And, you know, the legislature uh, sort of developed the best workaround they could, which was overriding vetoes and, you know, worked around uh, worked around that. But it does feel that there is a real opportunity um, for the legislature and the governor to work more closely together in the early stages of developing legislation. You know, I will say um, I disagree with Governor Scott on many issues, but until recently generally found him, um, you know, thoughtful and pretty careful. His veto letters explained pretty carefully why he was vetoing and what his concerns were. Um, I do feel, you know, you mentioned the Secretary of Education appointment that somehow his usual good judgment abandoned him and uh, and then the Senate gave him a way out by not confirming and he doubled down on his very odd, uh, odd decision. Um, and I think, uh, you know, whether the lawsuit was the right way to address that or not, I don't know, but uh, as I said, it feels like that relationship um, can be improved um, to the extent that is possible. Yeah, I have to say, uh, I, my own view is that um, this governor seems to have decided it's part of his political brand to operate in a, a very confrontational and contentious way with the legislature. And uh, I also have seen on many occasions that uh, when there are opportunities to work in a more collaborative way with legislative leadership at the committee level, where uh, legislation is birthed and shaped and um, finalized before it comes to the floor, that uh, his often his policy executives have taken a kind of a standoffish approach and um, also have seen many examples where uh, he, he watches the legislature do its thing without saying much and then he comes in at the 11th hour and says well I, I can't sign that and and that is just so counterproductive I, I, I feel it's it's frankly it's naive to expect that he's going to change his behavior if he keeps winning re-election based uh, running on that habit and on that pattern so I, I, I strongly support 
uh, the way that legislative leaders and, and members have stood up to him and have um, pushed for overriding vetoes, in most cases uh, recently successfully, uh, and that it is key for legislators to keep reaching out to executive branch agencies. I don't, we haven't talked much about this, but in my experience working at the State House as an advocate, you, you come into contact all the time with policy executives um, working at various um, levels of different agencies and state government. And it's really important to recognize that we, w there's humanity in all of us, that most all of them ca to, to a person are very dedicated to their work, are highly professional and very knowledgeable about what they do and what they know. And uh, we need to reach out to them as individuals and as professionals to engage them at the front end um, when we're shaping legislation, get their ideas on the table, um, show that we're responsive to their concerns, and, and try to sort of block out the noise from the executive office on the fifth floor of the pavilion building because that's not going to change realistically um, and I, I really commend the legislature for standing up to this governor my first interaction with the legislature my first meaningful interaction with the legislature started over a decade ago when I went to work for the Department of Housing and Community Development one of the things that kind of shocked me, and it wouldn't surprise me if many people are not aware of, is how little staff and policy support the members of the legislature have. You know, we all kind of know the federal model, right, where there's countless aides for each subcommittee and each committee and for each member and for each district and all of that. And our members of the legislature don't have anything like that. There is virtually no staff. There's a small office called Legislative Council that puts together the legal formatting of the bills at the direction of the members of the legislature. And there's a joint fiscal office that develops some of the um, financial analysis of how bills will impact the budget or the economy. But that's about it. Um, Having worked in the executive branch, I saw what that meant. What it meant was that the members of the legislature, um, by default, have to put significant reliance on the expertise of the executive branch. And as Larry mentioned, a lot of those people are really good people. A lot of those people are smart and well-informed and well-intentioned and all of that. But this dynamic can be a problem when the governor and the legislature have different priorities. One example of this that I saw personally was with transportation. Vermont has an enormous complex, VTrans I mean to say, has an enormous complex budget that includes paving, maintenance, new roads, bridges, culverts, and more. And simply reviewing it takes up almost all of the bandwidth of the legislature. Members of the legislature want to hear about creative alternatives for better public transit, better support for walking and biking and the like, but it's really hard to get that airtime, let alone develop creative strategies. I want to help do something about that. I spent um, the bulk of my career in working um, in nonprofits, and the name of the game um, was collaboration because we were so small we couldn't we couldn't accomplish anything if we didn't collaborate with others. And I I've been watching this over the last four years, and I'll start in my own backyard, the General Assembly. I think that there are th ways in which we could do things better. Um, we can determine early on where we have common interest um, well in advance of the session and chart the plan forward, decide which body is going to actually move what piece of legislation um, <clears throat> first. More joint Senate House hearings. It's a more efficient use of time. Um, in Maine, the budget is developed by a joint committee, um, which is a huge savings of time. And I... I um, and you reduce the back and forth, um, the obligatory back and forth um, between the House and the Senate. And we need to review the ways in which the calendar of practices of our bodies inhibit collaboration. And the issue <clears throat> about the relationship of the governor to the General Assembly. Um, disagreement is healthy and it's a check uh, on the power of both, but what isn't healthy or productive is a failure to engage throughout the process <clears throat> on the problems that we face. And the primary example of this, this session, was the property tax. Um, 
there is difficulty we face in getting the information that we need in order to craft good legislation. And an example of that is how much of the opioid settlement money has been spend it, spent at this point on this thing. Slow walking legislation <clears throat> also doesn't inspire a lot of faith. So I really look forward to trying to make it possible for our two bodies to work together in whatever ways I can. On the federal level, we see continued attacks on our democracy from the January 6th insurrection and Supreme Court decisions as recent as this month. What is Vermont's role in strengthening our democracy and what further legislation can we pass to ensure that Vermonters have the right to vote easily accessible and protected? And we will start with Larry. Well, I think we're several years into the experiment um, of same-day voter registration, and I strongly support that. It was the right thing to do, and um, I, I believe we need to keep telling people they can do it. When I'm out talking to people on the doors in the neighborhoods in this campaign, I find that a lot of people still don't understand that. And um, I do have a link on my campaign website to take them directly to that page on the Secretary of State's website that they can register online in a matter of minutes. Um, and uh, I, I reinforce that for people when I they tell me that they're not registered to vote. Um, but I also will say that um, I spent a lot of time this past weekend um, door knocking in the South Meadow neighborhood. And I was uh, interested to see that that um, more than half the residents there are new Americans. And of that group, um, the vast majority of them are citizens and are registered to vote. And we're aware of the upcoming election, which is awesome. I think many people um, that are not immigrants, refugees, take that right for granted. And uh, I think we have to keep talking about it. Um, I also think that we could go much further to encourage more voter participation. For example, um, here in Burlington, we pioneered the use of rank choice voting in elections. I think it's it, despite um, some hiccups a few years ago, I think it's, it's been the right thing to do, and it will continue to be a good model for the rest of the state. I'd like to see the legislature grow that. I also think that we should talk about restoring public financing of state campaigns. Um, again, uh, we tried that, and then it was abandoned. Um, with some issues with the Dean Corns campaign for Lieutenant Governor, especially we got a, I think it's worth trying again. I also think that we can require employers to provide paid leave time for people to go out and vote because not have, having election day be on a day when people don't have a paid leave time is a significant impediment. Finally, I would say that we live in an era where um, deep fake political messaging is a problem and we need to address that in a very forthright and aggressive way to make sure that people's understanding of what's actually happening is not contaminated by AI generated um, false claims and just stories that are concocted um, that are completely the opposite of the truth. So Tiff wanted to endorse my answer on one of the earlier questions, and I kind of want to endorse Larry's answer on this question. I agree with everything he said. Um, I'm just going to add a couple of other things. Uh, one is uh, what we have done with mail-in ballots, I think, has been a huge improvement and I think can be a demonstration to the rest of the country that this system can work. Um, I have one little concern about the fact that in certain elections everybody automatically gets mailed a ballot whereas in this election for example you only get a ballot if you request it i have found a number of people think that that's confusing and i think we may miss some voters who are just waiting to get that ballot in the mail so that's a little concern i have but overall i think the system is really good um, if anyone has any concerns about how we ensure that each person only votes once, we can talk about that. I have worked at the polls for years. I love working at the polls and I love seeing how we track these things. And I also love seeing how hopeful people are when they come in to vote in person. Um, it's really kind of a joyful thing. Um, I uh, endorse what Larry said about campaign finance and just want to add that I think it goes hand in hand with the problem of extreme income inequality. And so I think one thing we need to do, and I don't know if this is Vermont or national, but one thing that we need to do to protect our democracy is deal with extreme income inequality, which is creating, I think, some real threats. 
Um, and the last one, and, and this is kind of dark, but I think this is another threat to democracy, is the proliferation of guns. I would really love to see Vermont lead the way as a state that has a hunting culture and a gun safety culture, not captive to the NRA and the gun industry. And I do think that would help strengthen our democracy. Um, <clears throat> three and a half years ago, I took my oath of office on the same day that rioters stormed the Capitol. It was such an interesting juxtaposition. And, you know, that was the day that I recognized how fragile a democracy could be. <clears throat> so we've done a whole lot of things as a state to strengthen um, uh, voter participation. I think the way in which COVID compelled us to make the legislature open and available to people um, has been very healthy. Um, it doesn't require people to pick up and go to the legislature to listen to testimony, which was a big hardship for a lot of folks. Um, <clears throat> what more could we do? The mail-in ballots could be extended to primaries. We could extend ranked choice voting to state officials. But perhaps most importantly, <laughs> we have to consider what we need to do in order to make these positions possible uh, for average Vermonters. Um, who can run? You're paid for the days that you're in your seat. You don't get health insurance. Um, the impact on representation in our body <clears throat> is striking. It is why we have the average age that we do. Um, the Snelling Center in 1994 and then again in 2004 wrote reports recognizing <clears throat> the disconnect between the ideal of the citizen legislature and the reality of people's lives. So we have to tackle this issue. It's not, it's a political third rail in many people's minds, but I think it's critical to ensuring that our that, that our General Assembly really is representative. I don't disagree with anything anyone has said. Um, you know, I think we are, we are lucky in Vermont that we do have uh, really strong access to voting with universal mail-in ballots. Um, you know, there are some states that have done away with in-person voting entirely which saves a lot of money and also kind of solves the problem of having election day be on a work day when a lot of people can't can't get there. Um, you know, I think we have multi-party districts in this state, some of them, that's helpful for the health of a democracy. And, you know, I think um, for Vermonters, probably the most important thing we can do is support candidates to the U.S. House and U.S. Senate and governors in other states who support um, who support voting rights, and uh, you know, I think John Philpot Curran in 1790 was sort of sweetly naive when he said, "The price of liberty is eternal vi eternal vigilance. The price of liberty is eternal struggle against the forces of tyranny and authoritarianism." And we see it in this country, and we see it around the world. Um, and it is possible for the good people to win on this one, as we have also seen in, in many countries around the world. Um, you know, finally, I would, uh, I've got my, my Danforth Pewter Vermont Strong Key Ring. And on the back, it has that quote from Calvin Coolidge, if the spirit of liberty should vanish in other parts of the union and support of our institutions should languish, it could all be replenished from the generous store held by the people of this brave little state of Vermont. And uh, I believe that to be true. I'm sure you're all thinking, wow, these are all amazing candidates. How will I choose? And if you had ranked choice voting here statewide, you would be able to choose them all. <laughs> Just a subtle plug. But you would have to rank, which I, I love to make lists and to rank. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm just really would love to see a future where, you know, a voter could choose all four of you. 
All right, we have come to the final statements segment of tonight's uh, forum. I almost called it a debate, but you're not debating anything. You're agreeing with almost everything. <laughs> so here's your chance to differentiate yourself, right? Um, final two minutes each. We will start with Dale. Okay, and, and I, I want to start this closing as I began with a thank you to the organizations that put this together. I have to say it was really kind of fun to get the questions, the topics, see how each of these great organizations had something for us to chew on and think about and talk about here. Um, I have huge appreciation for that. Uh, one big issue that none of the organizations asked about was property tax reform and education spending. And that's something that I've been hearing a lot about, um, probably second only to housing and homelessness as I've been going around and knocking on doors. So I just wanted to say a little bit of something about that. Um, I think it is an issue that the legislature will be grappling with this January. Um, there are no easy answers, as was a lot of the things that we talked about tonight. Um, but I just wanted to talk about how I would look forward to approaching this. Um, I would approach it with respect for all sides, with a commitment to listen and learn and an openness to new ideas. I would want to recognize how property tax reform and education spending brings in so many other issues. It brings in housing, it brings in health care, which is a big driver of our education costs. It brings in workforce issues, both because teachers and other school system employees need places to live, but also because our system, our school system needs to be preparing the workforce of tomorrow. Um, so I bring this up like I said, not to suggest that I have a ready answer, but to highlight the way I'll approach being your representative. I want to use my years in private industry as general counsel for a construction company, in government, working for housing and community development, and as an environmental advocate to work with others collectively to address all of these important issues. Thank you. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm really proud of the work that the legislature's done over the last four years, um, a year of, and a half of which was spent on Zoom. Um, legislating is a team sport, but uh, maybe important, it might be important to note kind of where I've been particularly active or take the lead. Um, I've been really involved in shaping discussions about affordable disability and recovering house, recovery housing, investments in overdose prevention and restorative justice, employment protections for victims of sexual harassment, long overdue reforms of the child abuse registry process, and developing Vermont's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This job isn't just about policy. <clears throat> it's also about helping citizens um, and advocates across the, um, uh, sorry, access the legislature and testify. It's about helping constituents navigate state government because they haven't gotten their unemployment check. And it's about building relationships and better understanding the needs of your community and your neighbors um, so that you are can bring them to the legislature. I've been really proud to serve Chittenden 13. It's a really special district a look at the candidates here um, uh, and I I hope that I will earn your support to go back thanks so you know Dale is absolutely right property taxes and the underlying education spending are a big issue for people in this district I've also heard uh, a lot of concern about public safety um, and affordable housing our high on the list as well and they are all connected and I think you know for me looking at the panoply of challenges ahead of us the important thing is to recognize the interconnectedness property taxes driven by education spending as uh, as we heard the big, the fastest growing component of education spending is health care um, so we have to deal with health care costs and it is hard and it is complicated um, but it is doable, and you know I would sort of apply a fairly simple 
business type analysis to looking at the healthcare systems in developed countries around the world and simply ask, do they do their job? You know, how well do they do their job of producing and producing health and returning people to health? And how much does it cost per person? And how many, what percent of the population is covered? And the U.S. loses on all three criteria. Um, it's, it is not, you know, there, there are two kinds of hard choices. There's the hard choice where it's not at all clear what you should do. And then there's the hard choice where you know what you should do, but there is either resistance or pain involved in, in, in implementing it. Um, you know, I think that, um, and these things are all related, property taxes, affordable housing, homelessness, mental illness, addiction, crime. Um, again, all interconnected problems that we have to address simultaneously. And, um, you know, I hope that, as I said in the beginning, um, the perspective that I bring, having run a mid-sized manufacturing company through the Great Recession and through the pandemic, along with all the policy work I've done, will be helpful in addressing these problems in a holistic way. Um, I, I like that Dale brought up the tax reform issue because that is my leading edge issue in this campaign. Uh, and it's interesting because um, when I lived in Winooski 40 years ago, I actually ran for legislature twice unsuccessfully. The first time I got smoked, second time I uh, came within 26 votes of winning the Democratic primary there. And my number one issue in the late 1980s running for office was tax reform. <laughs> And here we are, 40 years later, having the same conversation. The uh, legislature uh, made some strides towards uh, uh, a result of the Brigham decision, redistributing the burden for education taxes more uh, equitably and in cre uh, creating the, the property tax rebate prebate program and the rent rebate program. But it's become clear that our consensus as a state for how we pay for schools has completely collapsed at this moment. And so we need um, people who are not afraid to think in, in a very bold and uh, progressive way about how we can remedy that. My own solution, um, which I've been talking up uh, as I talk to people in the district on the doors, is um, moved more towards income-based taxation. Um, Tiff mentioned a bill, H829, which would have created a higher incremental tax rate at the margins for people earning half a million dollars a year or more. And ironically, uh, Richard Snelling, a Republican governor, is the only governor who pushed through a, a graduated income tax rate during a deep recession in the 1980s, uh, and uh, th then it expired after three years. So we need to bring that conversation back to the table. Uh, I'm also the candidate who's most um, outspoken and forthright about the need for just cause eviction and reforming our outdated landlord tenant laws. And I would like to see Vermont enact a universal paid family medical leave bill. Um, it was proposed by the legislature, was adopted by one house and I believe not the other. And the governor in, in, in both cases when it came up um, either threatened to veto or vetoed it. I don't remember at this point. It's an easy benefit. It's the right and decent thing to do for 70,000 Vermont caregivers who were taking care of a loved one at, at home and have to leave their work. Their job or take time off from work to do that. So um, th that's th these issues reflect my values as a lifelong social service uh, provider and advocate for people with disabilities, and I hope to carry those values forward into the Vermont legislature if elected. Thanks. Last word, yeah. I want to thank you all for being here tonight and for being informed voters, and I want to thank, of course, our four candidates. Let's give them a round of applause. And much gratitude to our partner organizations. And please make sure you vote on or before August 13th for your primary. And for more issue, for more info on any of our issues, you can visit our websites. Thank you all. There's refreshments in the back. And the candidates will be, I'm sure, sticking around if you want to ask them a, a question. We didn't get time to that.